So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining in on this session. Uh, my name is Kyla Brown, and I'm the moderator for today's Public Interest Technology Lightning Talks. Uh, I'm a student at Queens College, and I'm excited that you all are excited about open data. So in the current digital era, uh, so much data is being produced, uh, but we must ask ourselves what to do with all this data. Uh, and from this event that we're gathered at today, uh, we know that data is knowledge and knowledge is power. Uh, we can use data to inform, empower, and inspire. So you will hear some, from some really talented and passionate individuals from diverse backgrounds about how they're using NYC open data to tackle urban issues. And I hope that you all leave this session eager to interact with open data and gain a greater appreciation for how it can be used from an equity-centric lens. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Shannon. Hi, everyone. My name is Shannon, um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm a master's student in urban planning with a background in architecture and psychology, and I'm working with the Public Design Commission to develop a framework of Nightscapes for Wellness, which seeks to explore the importance of nighttime and electric lighting design as facilitators for infrastructural health and environmental equity through the public realm. I believe that lighting design should be considered beyond the lens of safety and aesthetics, but also as a crucial factor in creating inclusive and urban spaces, experiences, and social infrastructure. This topic is close to my heart as my light mother is a lighting designer and exploring the practice through my passions for urban planning and public health is a labor of love to understand my mother's work better and in its, its intersections with my own. The geospatial process I'm sharing with you all today fits within my research as a potential methodology for urban lighting measurement and analysis that can be easily replicated and scaled across the city and beyond. The problem I have encountered is that there's neither public nor open data available to articulate the full portfolio of street lighting assets owned and installed by the city of New York, let alone luminaires that are privately owned and operated. Even if available, illumination can also be derived from many other sources, not just traditional streetlights, from commercial storefronts, informally installed lamps, construction scaffolding to traffic signals. This makes it difficult to measure lift lighting conditions accurately on the ground. And in turn, it is challenging to identify infrastructural gaps and opportunities for intervention. There's also generally a limited conceptualization of the relationship between lighting design and public health with, within urban planning resulting in a lack of analyses on their potential correlates in practice. This ignorance manifests across city agencies, as the DOT does not measure existing ambient conditions in their lighting installations, and the recent application for the Small Business Services $1.5 million commercial district lighting grant had not included any questions on how applicants intended to analyze existing urban conditions in the process of site selection. Over the last few months, I've been consulting with representatives from private, public, and nonprofit sectors, including but not limited to the DOT, lighting design experts, data scientists in academia, and public space advocates, drawing from a wide scope of diverse expertise to inform different potential approaches to urban lighting measurement. The emerging consensus was that the data I need does not exist, at least in, in publicly accessibly. So in the absence of publicly own streetlight asset data, how can existing um, publicly accessible data sets still be leveraged to identify neighborhoods with lighting intervention opportunities and inform decision making through metrics for urban wellness? Though data on permanent lighting fixtures does not is not available, I could still extract data sets of incidental lighting sources, such as sidewalk shed permits, link NYC kiosks, occupied storefronts, bus shelters, subway entrances, and newsstands all exist within New York City's open database. I further extracted traffic signals, cross crossing signals, and building entrances to, from OpenStreetMap, an open source participatory geographic database that is updated and maintained via open collaboration. These sources may serve as a proxy for lighting conditions as experienced by pedestrians, given the assumption that areas with higher densities of incidental lighting sources may likely have higher densities of permanent lighting infrastructure as well. These datasets allowed me to generate a point map of all incidental lighting sources as defined within the scope of the study. A potential development of my methodology may include weighting the different incidental lighting variables by their level of luminosity or ground coverage to build a more precise model of lighting conditions. I then spatially join them to neighborhood, neighborhood tabulation areas and determine their densities by calculating the number of features per square kilometer. Within the scope of this process, I define metrics for wellness as four different categories of facilities as defined by the New York City Department of Planning, human and health services, education, child welfare and youth, facilities, libraries and cultural institutions, and parks, gardens, and historical sites. 
Upon mapping both lighting sources and wellness related facilities and calculating their respective densities per NTA after performing both spatial joints, a bivariate symbology may uh, allows us to visualize all combinations of low, medium, and high densities of lighting versus facilities. Very quickly, you may establish color path maps of the city to identify potential neighborhoods that may benefit from further qualitative research, such as manual field surveys of public and private lighting sources or community engagement exercises to understand the lived experiences of residents. I piloted a potential manual survey mapping methodology on the East Village with lighting designers Lenny Schwendiger and Rikensing Gohel. Chloroplasts with smaller geographic units such as community districts, census tracts, or even street blocks may also help to identify or inform more granular areas for further research. Here, I performed a Geddes or GI star analysis to identify hot and cold spots by light source density per census block. I was also able to output correlation strata plots of incidental lighting versus wellness facility densities, and statistically significant positive correlations emerged across all four variables. In turn, understanding where infrastructure gaps may lie can inform decisions for intervention and investment of not only luminous streetscape assets, but facilities con conducive to wellness as well. As I continue to develop my framework for nighttime design conducive to urban wellness for the Public Design Commission, I hope that this approach may inspire more holistic and critical research methodologies for lighting policy and planning analysis. Thank you for your time. So thank you so much, Shannon. I'm now going to introduce um, Keaton. So yes. Um, so I'm Keaton Sinha. I'm the Deputy Director for Technology Development and Data at the uh, Office of the New York City Public Advocate. It took me a while to memorize all of that. Um, and I work a lot on our development projects in the office and our primary development project is the worst landlord watch list. And some of y'all may be familiar, but it's a public watch list. Well, I'm going to go through it. So I don't know why I'm explaining it right now, but, uh, I'm excited to give this presentation and thank you all for welcoming me up there. So what is the worst landlord watch list? The watch list is a tool that ranks the top 100 worst individual landlords across the five boroughs in terms of class B and class C violations in their buildings. This list is primarily created using the open housing preservation and development violations data on NYC open data. The watch list is published annually by the office of the New York City Public Advocate, a watchdog government of office that aims to bridge the gap between constituents and the rest of New York City government. We assist constituents directly through our Get Helpline, develop progressive policy recommendations, and introduce and co-sponsor legislation to the City Council. So the watch list is a tool meant to inspire tenant organizing, and it documents some of the most flagrant and egregious disregard for tenants' health and safety by bad landlords who have fought city ordinance through negligence and predatory practices. The landlords are highlighted on the watch list based on the amount of open violations their buildings have accrued. And so the watch list started under former public advocate and mayor Bill de Blasio. The list originally was based on a single open data source and tracked the worst buildings based on a simple name match. If a building's owner's names match, they fell under one landlord. The methodology has been since refined uh, since the original implementation. Um, and over the years, we kind of realized that the data was skewed more towards listing landlords with small two to three unit buildings instead of large numbers of violations being higher up on the list. In reality, landlords with a vast portfolio spending dozens of large buildings and possibly hundreds of tenants have a higher general impact than smaller landlords. And subsequently, the watch list methodology was changed to apply an equal weight to smaller and larger landlords by basing the calculations on the violations per unit rather than the violations per building. At this point, the watch list also transitioned from identifying the worst buildings in the city to the worst landlords instead. And so today, the watch list tracks not only the top 100 worst landlords across the city, but also the top 10 worst buildings overall in each borough, uh, along with the cumulative list of each building on the watch list. There are also visualizations comparing the locations of each watch list building to neighborhood racial and economic demographics. And it goes to show that watch list buildings are overwhelmingly and underserved in minority neighborhoods. All of this data comes from several open data data sets. Uh, most notably, we use the housing maintenance code violations data set, along with data sets from um, the Department of Buildings, Department of Finance, and NYDRA as well. Uh, we use all this to correspond landlords to their buildings and respective violations. 
And so additionally, we generate a lot of working data as well, such as month-to-month -month violation averages from cross-referencing the various open data data sets. Uh, this working data is used to inform our policy and communications departments and also allows us flexibility in responding to ongoing houses, ongoing housing and crises and issues in the city. And so the modern watchlist methodology relies on calculating the average of open violations per unit. And this is done primarily to uh, ensure that our rankings are not subject to open violation fluctuations, such as the lack of heat violations during the warmer summer months. Um, here we can actually see the disparity even in the top five worst landlords of this past year in terms of their average open violations. Um, Jonathan Santana slash David Opshlow, um has almost 2,000 more than the number five landlord, number five worst landlord. And so this all comes together on the website to build an individual portfolio for each landlord on the top 100 list. The portfolio includes statistics generated across each landlord including number of evictions and tax liens on their buildings, along with the list of each of their buildings with enough violations to qualify for the watch list. So moving on to more kind of the impact of the watch list rather than just, you know, the technical mumbo jumbo, the watch list generates significant press for many New York publications during what, what we like to call watch list season, which is basically October through January um, of every year. The coverage receives spread to awareness to tenants of housing resources compiled on the watchlist site and assists in the naming and shaming of the offending landlords and helps to build legal cases and financial scrutiny against them. Against the landlords, that is not the tenants. Um, the watchlist has also been used for housing and public health research, such as this paper from an NYU researcher showing how local government can use housing inspections to improve public health. This paper was actually published pretty recently, I think in the past month or so, um, and it utilized historical watch list data from the from the watch list from 2011, 2014, 2017, and 2018. Um, it's also been the subject of documentaries. Uh, there's a three part satirical documentary called New York's New York's Worst Landlords by comedian Jeff Seal, highlighting the horrific conditions that the tenants of watch list buildings live in, along with how difficult it is to actually get in contact with them and to identify these landlords. Um, even more significantly, the watch list is used by many tenant and housing advocacy organizations, including Community Voices Heard, Churches United for Fair Housing, and the statewide coalition Housing Justice for All to strengthen and identify organized tenant networks. The watch list is also used heavily by journalists and banks to review landlords' financials. I really like this picture because it looks like the dog is also protesting. Um, this year was especially significant for watch list news as a new record for number of violations was set by the property manager, David Obshalom. Obshalom has been found in contempt of court for not fixing hundreds of violations and is serving a two month stand at Rikers uh, starting this past Thursday. Additionally, Obshalom attempted to hide the true ownership of his properties by listing the landlord, Jonathan Santana, as the head officer. Some landlords will actively skirt ownership of their buildings by listing a different head officer or using an LLC to hide the true ownership of the building. And so that's kind of why I pointed out that chart earlier where it says Jonathan Santana is the head officer. He's listed as the head officer in all these buildings, but it's really those properties are owned by David Oakshalom. So that's a, that's a pretty common occurrence. Um, in this vein, we would love to see an improvement in the data sets we use through more timely, proactive updates to violations easier identification of landlords for cross-referencing records and through promoting LLC transparency to close the loophole that landlords use to hide true ownership of their properties. The future of the watch list is bright and we want to continue to shine a light on the worst actors in the city and to bolster the voices of tenants all across the city. Uh, the watch list is a prime example of how these kinds of tools based on freely available data can be used to help visualize the widespread harm that bad landlords can cause. And a thank you to all of y'all who work in the digital civic space. Um, it's to the collective years of knowledge in this field that something like the watch list was born out of and was built with. And I hope my talk has shared that projects based on this kind of data can have a very real impact. And I hope we can all stay in touch. Thank you, Keaton. So now I'm going to introduce Julia. Uh, my name is Julia, and I'm going to talk to you today about using data visualization and New York City open data to create tools for advocacy and equity. 
Um, unlike a lot of the speakers at the conference today, you'll notice that I am not here representing a research institution or an NGO. I am just here as Julia today. Uh, this work is outside of my nine to five and I work at a startup in the private sector, actually. Um, but that's relevant to my talk today because part of this talk is about how you don't have to have a graduate degree to do research and uncover insights that can help reduce inequity. So in January 2022, a residential fire happened at 333 East 181st Street in the Bronx that became one of the deadliest fires in New York City history. This was a horrible tragedy and 17 people died. The victims were mostly immigrants of African descent and the cause was determined to be a malfunctioning space heater that caught fire and spread smoke into many other apartments. At the time that the fire happened, I had recently moved back to the city and I remember reading the tragic news from my apartment. I, I read that the deadliness of the fire uh, was actually due to several key fire doors that did not automatically close when residents fled their apartments. This combined with the usage of space heaters in the building to begin with made me start to think that there could be some broader systemic issues at play as to why this tragedy happened in the first place. People don't use space heaters unless the heat in their units is insufficient, and city records actually show that tenants in this same building have filed complaints about lack of heat, a broken radiator, and a door that didn't close properly. These quotes that I'm showing, which are from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, articles published in the wake of the fire, seem to reveal potential issues with the management and maintenance of these residences as safe heating in New York City is a right. The Twin Parks Northwest Building is also home to a really diverse and multicultural group of New Yorkers. These same groups, unfortunately, are more likely to face discrimination and marginalization in many aspects of life. So from what I was reading, it seemed like equity issues faced by these communities could possibly even extend to whether the very buildings these New Yorkers reside in are safe and adequately maintained by owners or landlords. Uh, as I continued reading the upsetting coverage of the fire in the news and listening to lived experiences on Twitter, I became convinced that this couldn't be an isolated incident. Uh, I worked on the public sector team at a data visualization company at the time called Tableau, and I was convinced that the city's historical data would likely reveal systemic equity issues that form the context for why tragedies like this might happen disproportionately to marginalized communities, or if fires like this were more likely to occur in certain parts of the city. So I went on to New York City Open Data and I pulled fire dispatch data, visualized it in Tableau, and immediately saw some pretty visually striking results. Uh, data visualization is a really effective tool, both for the analysis process and for communication and presentation, because of how visually obvious results can be very quickly. You can see in this map the dark magenta shading area in the map uh, that's focused on the Bronx. As I continued to work with the data, I was able to rank the community districts in New York City by which experienced the most residential fires. As you can see in the chart on the right, uh, six out of 10 of the CDs experiencing the most fires are in the Bronx. I use labeling as well as color in the chart on the right to show which CDs in the Bronx are most affected. After I explored the fire dispatch data set, I decided to cross-reference it with 2020 census results to get a view of the demographic makeup of the community districts experiencing the most fires. The results were also pretty striking. Nine out of 10 of the CDs facing the most fires have majority Black and Latino, Latina, Latinx identifying residents, with most of them having between 70 and 90% residents identifying as one of these categories. This fire was initially caused by a space heater, and like I mentioned before, people don't use space heaters unless the heat in their unit is insufficient. I figured this could possibly also be borne out in the data on heat and hot water complaints, which I pulled next. The Bronx had the highest number of complaints by far, with approximately one complaint per every 25 residents. This is nearly twice the rate of the complaints in Manhattan, as you can see in the bar chart. I was also able to find some data by a community district regarding the use of supplemental heat. Uh, again, note the concentrated shading in the Bronx. As I was looking at this map, it struck me just how similar it looked to the initial map that I had generated on the frequency of fires in community districts. So I decided to create a side-by-side -side comparison of this map, the map of fires, and a map of boroughs with the majority Black and Latino, Latino, Latinx residents. So you can see the results here. From left to right, these maps show a concentration of multi-unit residential fires, homes using supplemental heating, and percentage of Black and Latino, Latino, Latinx identifying residents. Again, visually, the results are pretty striking. You can see really similar patterns in all three of these maps and that same concentrated shading in the Bronx. So the January 2022 fire really didn't seem like an isolated incident, but part of a broader pattern that was borne out by the data. The results both really upset and galvanized me, and I showed this analysis to the Data Equity Hub team at Tableau, where I worked who published it in their blog and sent the findings out in a newsletter where they compiled other data equity stories. Uh, not long after this newsletter went out, I got an email. 
It turned out that other people were also really interested in this data and wanted to bring to light the systemic issues that created the backdrop for tragedies like the January 2022 fire. A uh, Stanford burn surgeon and public health researcher named Dr. Cliff Schechter reached out to me and asked if he could use my analysis to publish an academic paper. I said yes. So over the next few months, I went back and forth with Dr. Schechter and his team, providing the data I use and creating visualizations. Uh, the previous visual analysis I had shown you was a survey of the existing data, but it didn't demonstrate statistical significance on its own. So what Dr. Schechter's team did was create a mixed effects model that was actually able to find significant association between fires and heat complaints, as well as a significant variance among the community districts. The study demonstrated that frequency of heating complaints was significantly associated with the frequency of structural fires in New York City. It also showed that more fires occurred in districts with greater proportions of Black and Latino, Latina, Latinx residents. Many of the factors that I had suspected were potentially at play seemed to be true. Shortly after the paper was published, the results were also published in USA Today, bringing more awareness to the disparities faced by communities in New York City when it comes to safe heating, uh, which should be an equally applied right across the city. As an employee at a private sector tech company with some data analytics skills, the opportunity to bring this data to light in an academic publication was super unique for me. And I really encourage any other folks considering themselves citizen data scientists or whatever we call ourselves uh, to keep exploring the data, especially on really important topics like this. So as you explore data as a citizen data scientist, I want to share a resource that has been really important in helping me bring equity first mindset to my analyses from the data collection stage all the way to the visualization and presentation stage. It's called the Do No Harm Guide, published by the Urban Institute. Uh, I used the Do No Harm Guide as I was creating this analysis, and I really encourage anyone building data visualizations that are focused on people and communities to use this resource. It's really helped me consider my data sources and their limitations, understand formatting, labeling, and design decisions that may affect the way that my analyses come across, and to always tie back to the actual people and lived experiences at the center of my analysis. The crux of my analysis was heavily influenced by reading personal accounts on Twitter, especially the connection between supplemental heating, ignored heating complaints, and the incidence of fires. So I will leave you here with a few takeaways. Hopefully, I have encouraged you to also use New York City open data as a tool to create advocacy and awareness of equity issues. Data visualization is a really effective tool for communication, but it should always be done with an equity first mindset and always take into account the lived experiences of the communities it's about. And really anyone can use the tools made available by NYC Open Data to advocate for change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, and now we're going to have our last speaker, uh, last but not least, <laughs> Isaac. Um, so yeah. Cool. Hey, I'm Isaac. So we may recognize me as organizer for Transit Techie. Uh, our next event is, is Monday, so it's a pro-up. Um, did it go to the next slide? Oh, on you. So this talk is pragmatic accessibility data about New York City subways. And before we really get into it, I'd like to define pragmatic formally. So that is dealing with things sensibly and realistically in a way that is based on practical uh, rather than theoretical considerations. So just like Shannon's first talk um, where lighting was not very pragmatic because a lot of the lighting around the cities uh, simply do not show up in the available data. Um, we're going to talk about some pragmatic things about subway data as well. So who am I? Uh, like I said in the beginning, I already organized the Transit Techies meetup. Um, next meetup is Monday at 5.30 about um, 3D modeling of subway stations. So that was, that's going to be really cool. Um, I contribute to the MLOS meetup, but that's uh, kind of like a side thing. But in general, um, I'm interested in you know how science, math, technology, and, and community, more importantly, can be used together to redistribute you know power to groups and individuals who who do not have it. Um, so that's what uh, is the motivation for this work, and also the transit techies meet up really. Um, so let's let's get into it. So um, so here are Google Maps directions from two locations, from Grand Central Terminal to um, Flushing Avenue in Brooklyn. And so the one on the left is, I guess you can't see it because of the Zoom thing, but the one on the left is not accessible. Um, and then the one on the right is using the accessible option on Google Maps. And then so uh, I don't know how much time I have per slide, but take a gander at it and look at some things between the non-accessible and the accessible ones that might jump out to you. And if you don't have the time or if it's too small, we're going to get to it right now. Um, so the first thing, is um, 
on the right hand side at the very top google maps adds a disclaimer that says use caution wheelchair accessible directions may not uh, always reflect real world conditions aka it is not pragmatic um walk time is actually less for the accessible route so on the not accessible it says walk time is two minutes and the accessible route all of a sudden it's faster if you're in a wheelchair it's one minute um and also um the real world context um is missing so canal street is a major transfer uh, point for the non-accessible route and chambers street is uh, also a major transfer transfer point for the accessible route um, and transfer points are often crowded so if the elevator is technically working but the station is crowded is that pragmatically accessible um and also at the very bottom at the accessible route on the right hand side it does not take zero seconds to get to the street level so it says you arrive the station comes in at 12 50 p.m and then you arrive at the Flushing Avenue street level, also at 12.50 p.m. Also, I'm in a wheelchair, not pragmatic. Um, so the lack of pragmatism in subway directions makes it a lot harder for um, digitally savvy wheelchair users to accurately plan their, their trips to new places. Um, so the government did think of this, or specifically the MTA. So the MTA does have an open tri trip planner that is, in practice, more pragmatic. But the downside is uptime is just not as good. So even when um, we do have a, a kind of like public alternative with the MTA trip planner, I just took a screenshot here when I was randomly using it one day and the trip planner was just down. And from the Gator icon, I, it looks like they're using HostGator for their hosting, which uh, does, is not the best hosting service. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So oh yeah, one more example. I was walking in Harlem one day um, to visit the only man on earth who could actually accurately cut my hair. Um, and, um, the subway was down. So 135th station was down in Harlem. Um, so I was like, okay, let me check if this elevator was reported down. Uh, so this was around October 21st at around nine or something AM. And here's a screenshot from my phone at nine 39 and, uh, it was not listed as down. So the only ones that were down at the time were two thirty third street, one out of three. Uh, were out, was out Times Square, always one of the 10 are out. Uh, Fulton Street, one of them was out. But here I was looking with my eyes at 135th and the elevator was not reported down. Um, so not only, um, we'll, we'll get into why the station's unpragmatic, but it was unavailable to begin with. And it was also unpragmatic because at this particular station, you have to cross a four lane highway to get to um, uh, to get to a, a free a, a island in the middle of a freeway. Um, another reason why I was unpragmatic was you don't know it's down until you leave the station. And so I guess for me, um, uh, I actually had, I floated around a little bit to see if someone ran into the issue. There was someone in a walking, not necessarily wheelchair, who we had to like manually help up um, the, the stairs. So after you leave the station, you really only have three options. So you have to ask the station agent to let you back into the station. Nine times out of 10, they will. Um, wait for someone to help you up, which is the, what the person who I helped, um, opted to do. And then, um, the last point about this is that these choices are not documented anywhere, nor can the MTA at, like officially endorse them because you're not supposed to ask the gate agent to just let you in. You're not supposed to rely on someone to just wait around and help you up the stairs. Um, so not documented and they can't even be officially endorsed. Um, so what's the solution? Um, so I've been building for like maybe the past five months ish accessibility.nyc. Um, so I've been working with the accessibility committee for transit authority, um, and just having, uh, cursory conversations about what it would look like to, uh, to crowdsource accessibility, pragmatic accessibility, accessibility data about subways. Um, so, oh, oh yeah, I had a demo in this talk and then they said it's a lightning talk, so I can do it. But if you visit that site, um, you'll be able to see the website. You could click on an accessible station and then leave your comments about that station. The goal is for it to, to record some of this more pragmatic, kind of like what Shannon was saying, like real world conditions. So for example, if a station is across the street from a high school, technically the elevator's up, but the weekdays at 3 p.m. gets packed. So no one's actually going to be able to get up and down that elevator pragmatically. Uh, so that's what this is is for. I, I wish I had time for a demo, but it's fine. Um, so disclaimers, room for improvement. Um, 
I have one user now. Um, I, so <laughs> I had several users. Um, so background, I'm a data scientist by training. So I calculate things. I don't build things, as you could tell by the UI on the website. Um, so the UI needs to improve. I'm working with one expert in the ACTA as time allows her, uh, as time allows in her busy schedule. And obviously, as you look on the site, you'll see a bunch of UI UX improvements, um, elevator data, working on that, um, train data needs to be added. And, you know, any glaring issues you see, there's a contact form on the website where you can email me and see the meetup that's happening Monday. Um, and that's it. Yeah. So what I need from you is to, to like use it and, and give me, you know, constructive criticism. You could be as honest as possible. And what I'm looking for is some of these quotes. So for example, after 3 p.m. on school days, the station is full of high school students. Don't get off at this station if you're transferring to the QM17. Um, it usually skips the stop at rush hour. Um, for those of you who like regularly take the bus during rush hour, once it gets too packed, it just defaults into express mode apparently. Uh, platform is unsafe during rush hours, which is another um, documented issue. Um, where the elevators technically work, but the station's packed, so people are scared to get to the elevator. Not there's no like technical issue, and so all of these for all these reasons, the data is unpragmatic. Um, and that is my talk. I hope I was on time. Thank you. So yes, so yeah, I just want to say thank you to all the wonderful speakers. Your presentations were amazing, and we're now going to be entering a Q and A portion. So. We're going to open it up to the audience if y'all have any questions. Um, I'm Rebecca. Um, I have a question for Julia. Um, I was wondering how you found out about the supplemental heat, like if that was in a data set. Like it just seems so specific. And I'm wondering, like, yeah, how you found that out? The supplemental like, heating map that I showed you? Oh, yeah. Or even like how, like, mapping, how do you even know, like, how many people are in the data supports will be? That's a great question. That was a data set that I found uh, on the internet. I'm not sure if it was New York City open data or not. I think that a group of researchers or a like team of journalists had done that research and had made the data set available. So I was able to pull it in and kind of crop track and say, but the rest of my analysis. Oh, yes, very specific. And I was glad that I found it. Okay. I have a question for Isaac. Face the mic. I'm just kind of wondering what was your motive? What is your motivating factor? Do you even have family members who have struggled with this? What is uh, what was what's your motivating factor for this beautiful project? Oh yeah, thank you. Um, so no, I don't have any family members. My mother's um, she doesn't use a wheelchair, but she needs a cane. Um, but my main motivational factor is kind of just um, usage of the data so it's very like a data technical motivation i think civic data is not really i don't want to say accurate but it's not real like the the average person can't really use it kind of have to be like all of us are here because we're super civic data nerds and that's not reflective of, of real life so that's why i wanted to do it yeah 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 yeah, thanks for one, 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 one presentation about the question for I think. Oops. And you, I was wondering if you have plans to also uh, look at the public toilets in this stage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't have plans, but I, I do know, I forgot the name of it. There is someone who has a data set that plugs into your Google Maps that um, it's not public toilets, but it's. Um, private businesses where if you walk in confidently enough, you could use that. <laughs> I don't, like someone here probably has that link, but I use that sometimes when, when I need to use a bathroom. Yeah. Is it got to go? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that one, it's not public. It's not government sanctioned. I probably shouldn't be advertising it. <laughs> it's if you walk in confidently enough, you could use a bathroom. Uh, K-chan, 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 can you, uh, so into portfolio wide uh, data once you see that one building is has a huge amount of violations like and you also you also have the capacity or do any of us that so we should go in and see like portfolio wide because you know like just fits you can see like the relationships between buildings but it's, it's i found it a struggle to act as a bit like yeah portfolio wide data once it's all 
that's my biggest struggle is that I didn't you know, build my building by building. It, it is a bit of a struggle, and I think it's it's something that a I think so like the average citizen it, it might order on near possible just because there aren't very many fun fixing tools like just fix is an amazing tool but again it's it's a purposeful thing it's got limitations and if you're looking for something outside of its limitations you're going to struggle with that tool same thing kind of applies to the watches as well i mean we we have a purpose here we're building for that but even on the data side it's something that we struggle with i mean um for example for any building, making sure it belongs to the person we're saying it belongs to, you know, because we don't want to open ourselves up to like the faucet and stuff, um, it's pretty important. So we have to double, triple check everything. And it takes three or four different data sets cross referencing between registration data, between uh, the open violations, between the, the, the buildings, the DOB data, all this stuff to make sure that who we're like assigning the spine to is actually that person. So it's kind of answered your question more. I think it is technically possible, but like many things that are technically possible, it's so really hard. And just have a question for you, do um, I think this month there was like an LLC disclosure log. Does that affect its analysis? It does that make it easier? Does that, how does that practice? So the order, right? I think that has that the state level, like over also, it just passed. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. I've worked most on the technical side of things, and I haven't had a great chance to look at it yet. Um, but I am hoping it does. I take some back go on web such and do complete data set. Yeah. That's good. That, that is well. Yeah. Oh. Even the, the, the white sweater. Yeah. Um, I just had a question for, for Shannon. Um, I was wondering um, what your. Um, kind of what aspects of um, equity and lighting um, you were exploring. And if you could talk a little bit more about how lighting affects um, living conditions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is an ongoing research process and I've been having a lot of conversations with everything from accessibility experts to um, public space advocates and thinking about how like there is a need to really kind of create a top-down and bottom-up effort to advocate for more holistic considerations of the 24-hour and after-dark day, um, and especially in relation to streetscape design. Um, everything from providing socialization opportunities to creating more equitable um, commutes for night shift workers um, to um, kind of combating the NYPD floodlights and how inequitably like they're being just like distributed across the city, especially disproportionately affecting low rural populations in nitro complexes. Um, and I believe that those kinds of inequitable practices wouldn't exist if there was like a precedent effort to think about like nighttime conditions. Um, and so just advocating for more synergies between um, city agencies in collaboration with public and nonprofit sectors, I think is really important um, for our kind of 24 hour city development moving forward. I'm there, quick, yeah. Um, Sir Keating, well, actually, I'm, first thing is, I'm really curious about what the worst landlord map would look we'll like with the sheet of the linear maps, sheet of the empire, and says, Metrolines up in there. I was thinking that, I'll just, yeah. Um, but uh, it seems like one of the biggest potential uses for the worst landmark list is just allowing tenants to know that they have this commonality of having the same landlord, especially when all the work is sort of revealing the fact that these buildings are actually owned by the same people. Is there any way that either advocacy organizations or tenants are able to communicate with each other or, or learn through this list who else they might have or have an opportunity to live there? So first off, I will I will say that when I saw Julia's map, it looked very familiar to me because whenever we map out landlord watch the buildings, it's it's always exactly the same like hot spots. Um, even though like our especially our like some of our bro data is a little bit incomplete just due to the nature of the data, but that's the yeah, the point. Um to your point, we actually find it's kind of the other way around sometimes. When we go to these watch list buildings, we'll find that there already are tenant advocate organizations. Um for example, Oak Shalom's 
uh, buildings already had a um, a a tenant union that were had been desperately fighting against for years. Um, but at the same time, we do also provide some resources on the website, and um, we this this is more so a office initiative rather than a like tech initiative. But we do make uh, efforts to reach out to those tenants and to like make them aware that you know your building is. You know, it's not just you. This building is actually a horrible place to live, and it's because of your horrible landlord. And here are other resources that you can use. There's other people that are in the same situation. Let's organize, you know, and we help them through that as well. Hi, thank you. Um, my question's for Julia. It's more about the like emotional. I know you did this project on your own time, and obviously it was like a very tragic situation that inspired it. And, like, can you talk about like the emotional aspects of like doing this on your own time and finding these horrible things about fires? Yeah, I was actually experiencing that again last night when I was finishing my speaker's nest for this. As soon as I finished, I noticed myself like very dysregulated, essentially. And uh, I think, yeah, for people who do civic tech work like Sans and you look at this data and essentially like I talked about the general harm guy, remembering that each data point is a person a lot of the time, it can be pretty taxing. Um, so yeah, I encourage everyone who does this kind of work to like really be aware of your body when you're doing things like this because yeah, it can definitely take a toll. And um, yeah, I mean, there's one empty, especially in the types of people who are called to do work. Um, so yeah, I definitely resonate with that. Um, whether I have advice, I don't really know. It kind of, yeah, I mean, you're going to be moved by tragedy. And I, I think that uh, I have data skills. And so it, it feels like one of the more like unique ways that I have the opportunity to get back and, and potentially like make some noise or make a change. So that's why I choose to do stuff like this. Um, but yeah, it can definitely be emotionally taxing. My question is for anyone on the panel will be able to speak to addressing sources of bias that are evident or perhaps considerations that you took to address not on the apparent sources of bias in your public and other available data sets. So um, for us, because we are a government office, we're very cognizant of the fact that, you know, like for our number one landlord, this this pastor David Opshalom, obviously we had a big like press junket. We did communications about it, but all of that is based on a set methodology that's used for everybody. And um, we've talked about this a lot in terms of like um, having something like a um, a list of the best landlords. That's been something that's uh, been floated to us before, which is which is not an idea that I really need to honestly like entertaining and all, um, but also, you know, which besides my personal opinions about it, it's also very difficult to do data. Work. What does that mean? That's going to be like somebody's grandmother living in like, you know, Brooklyn who wants to rent out her basement unit or something, right? It's, it's not like, it's, it's much harder to quantify that. So being cognizant of the fact that what we're quantifying is actually applicable to all of these individuals and we're calling the worst landlord. It's very important to us and it's why our methodology is something that we are the most hesitant to change it's something that i think we are like most stuck on not changing i'll just add kind of a general data comment while doing this kind of work i think a source of bias can sometimes be what data is absent from the data set so just like understanding the gaps in the data especially when you cross reference a lot of data sets sometimes things get filtered out unintentionally and uh, adding disclaimers and calling out like, which groups are not included in the analysis, or you know, is there data that's underreported because of other certain factors at play is always something important to think about these kinds of analyses. I just want to second that because especially in housing, there are so many tenants who are terrified. The worse the circumstances are in a building, the more they are on being harassed or intimidated or perhaps they're not, they're, they're not completely here in the country. Like the more vulnerable the tenants, the less likely they are to call big one one to actually create the data that would actually help prove that there is a really terrifying situation going on. So there's an absence that can't be proven away. And so then you have to look at other, other data or what personal stories that might, that might be anonymized. And sometimes you use design to call that out too. Like for example, you know, if there's 
underreporting in a certain district, or I look at odd court plus maps of the US. A lot of the times the territories are left out, you know, where you go on virtual courts, you can call it out with design and kind of like draw a box around it and say, this data does not exist in this data set, or other ways to kind of call it out and represent it. Uh, for people with skills to want to volunteer, uh, but don't have project or an idea where you recommend you start? Kind of, I'll say in Taproot is really cool. Um, I've found a lot of orgs that are looking for people with data souls there, and that's kind of how I started my volunteering journey many years ago. So that's one resource I use. I think this can jump and say code for America, those obviously a big role here, and I do have such it's volunteers as well, Donald. Yep. I would also say that the Housing Data Coalition, uh, there are a few folks, maybe even in this room, but that have this conference who contribute to that, went to their latest hackathon, um, and that was just about making already available data readable for activism. So things like that, I think, um, are, are super important from a volunteer sense if you have tech skills. I guess this is for anyone on the panel that was kind of going off um, the previous question of gals in the data set. I kind of wondering about um, what role would there be for sort of blending more qualitative and quantitative methods in this sort of research of like there's some there's some information that's only accessible by the analysis of the data set, right? And there's some things that you only gonna find out by talking to people. Um, or Jerry mentioned, you know, you're on Twitter or other places where people are giving you all the ground information that's just gonna not be seen in the numbers. Um, and I just wonder, and you have um, thought or job or talking about methodologies out of like blending these two um, ways of information gathering where that's played a role in your work at all. Um, yeah, this, so uh, I'll bring up the last sort of a bit of example of this. Um, it, I mentioned it's, it's continually improving and one improvement that I want to make is, you know, if, if you visited the largest of four, it, it's a cool website, I think. Um, but like, it's just a bunch of numbers, right? Like it's, it's, it, it, it's impressive to be like, okay, you know, David Oak has 5,000 violations and the fifth person has a thousand, but what does that actually mean? Right. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to want to add and will probably add to the website is, um, kind of tenant testimonials. Our office has the capability to go to these tenants, talk to them, to get their stories, to get images, to get pictures, to get their side of things. And that should be out there, you know, it's, it's your Oak Shalom tenant. If you're a watch list landlord tenant, your story should be up there beyond just the numbers. The numbers, no, the numbers mean something, but it's the stories that really contextualize the And it's just not always possible, but sometimes, especially with social media data, you're saying something like sentiment analysis or tapping or NLP, sometimes the possibility you can look for keywords and, um, yeah, you can use different programs to do that. And like sometimes kind of bring along that data with some of the layer quantitative data. Uh, it's not always perfect, but I think like you said, a combination of personal stories of data, it's also really important in analysis because a lot of the time, like I've said, these data points are people and experiences. I, I, I'll answer that and say that it's, I found in my experience building accessibility.nyc is that you, you could earn qualitative data by using doing the most with what's already available. Um, mm -hmm. So a little bit of the background, this actually started as um, it was supposed to be a talk on elevators and about um, the patterns in elevator maintenance or non-maintenance. And then as I was analyzing that data, I showed it to the accessibility committee. And then well, like as we figured out through that data, we kind of concluded that the data is not really representative of the real world, which is why we did this, but to even get the stories of what was actually going on, I had to initially analyze what was already available, which is um, pretty um, not too useful elevator data. Um, so I think you could earn qualitative data by showing people what the gaps are and, and what's, our, what's currently being recorded. Hey, we have time for about one more question. So if anyone. Yeah, this question is mostly targeted for Julia, but I'm curious a little more about the process of like having academics, especially at a pretty elite institution, like reach out to you and then want to collaborate and work with you, but also that process, like visualizations are really accessible to 
public, but then like in medical journals, yeah, like statistical analysis is kind of the rule of what is true, right? Or what is considered most viable. Mm-hmm. So what was it like kind of seeing that work if translated into that and negotiating for relationship with them? It was super cool, actually. Cliff is a really cool guy. And on the side, I really lucked out for that particular researcher to reach out to me. I'm super surprised that I happened to because that I had just put that in a newsletter on my employer. And then this, you know, actual very tenured academic person uh, emailed, I think, like, have a PR department. And then I got an email from them being like, this person wants to talk to you. Um, so it was, it was, yeah, it was pretty cool. It's the first time anything like this has ever happened to me. Um, the process of kind of translating the data and my work into the paper was actually pretty collaborative. Um, yeah, every time they had a drop, they shared it back with me and I was able to provide input, edits and things like that. And then, um, the actual research letter that got published eventually, it had kind of the statistical analysis and scatter plots and things like that, but they didn't need one of my original visualizations also in the paper, the one that's comparing those three maps against one another. Um, so I was really fixed with that and yeah, uh, the experience was super positive for me as some of you said, not super well versed in the world of academia. Um, I'm not sure if it's always on that link, but uh, yeah, I'm going to see a Well, I'm going to end the Q&A here. Thank you all for presenting and sharing your experiences and wisdom with everyone. And thank you all for listening and engaging. I'm going to end off our session here. But yeah, you probably want to approach these very amazing people after and ask them more questions. So yeah, feel free to do that as well. But thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.